Und Russland, ja, Russland hat die Energieversorgung Europas eingestellt. Mancher von der AfD und mancher von den Leuten, die immer alles querdenken, hat es ja immer noch anders in der Erzählung. Aber es war der russische Präsident, der die Gaslieferung durch die heile Pipeline gestoppt hat. This is my video update on this Sunday afternoon, December the 10th. Let's talk about some news. And let's uh, start things off with uh, Alex Jones. And he has been reinstated onto Twitter X. His account is back on Twitter X. This is uh, this is huge news, actually. Uh, Elon Musk he he put out a poll the other day, and he asked Twitter X uh, users if they believe that Alex Jones' account should be reinstated on the platform, and the results were roughly seventy percent in favor of Alex Jones being back on. Twitter X and 30% against. And so Elon Musk, he reinstated Alex Jones' account. So uh, this followed a Tucker Carlson interview. So Tucker Carlson interviewed Alex Jones. That's what, that's what kicked all of this off, to be quite honest. Tucker interviews Alex Jones. Then, uh, then Elon, Musk's, Elon Musk puts out this poll on Twitter X. People voted, and now Alex Jones is back on the platform. So Alex Jones, he, uh, he said that he was, in a statement, he said that he was the first domino to fall in what became uh, a cancel, a social media cancel culture, right? He was the first big name that was canceled throughout all of social media, and, uh, and then we saw a lot of other um, accounts being canceled across social media and uh and now it looks like elon musk is going to be reversing this trend and you know that the the mainstream media and the globalist elite they are going to absolutely freak out with uh, alex jones being back on twitter on twitter x boy are they going to freak out but uh, good on elon very very good move from elon musk and uh and alex jones should absolutely be uh be back not only on on twitter x he should be allowed back on on all of the big social media platforms so uh tucker carlson's interview it uh, it made a huge difference what a blessing it was for uh, fox news to fire tucker carlson huh what a blessing, because now Tucker is, is able to, to interview people like uh, Alex Jones and really make a difference. I mean, Tucker really made a big difference by getting Alex Jones back on the Twitter X platform. And Tucker Carlson, the other day, he interviewed Gonzalo's father, Gonzalo Lira Sr., and that uh, was about a 20 minute segment. You can find it on Tucker's Twitter account on his show that is on Twitter X. Definitely check out the interview of uh, Gonzalo Lira's father, Gonzalo Lira Sr. And, uh, and hopefully this interview, the attention that Tucker Carlson has now uh, brought to the to the imprisonment of uh, Gonzalo Lira. Hopefully this will also make a difference and this will secure the release of, uh, of Gonzalo Lira. But um, definitely check it out. I'm not gonna really say much about the, the interview because you can see it, it's 20 minutes long. Gonzalo Lira's father, he does an excellent job in, uh, in explaining the situation and explaining how it's wrong that the Alensky regime has imprisoned Gonzalo Lira, who is 
an American citizen and how the Biden White House is uh, doing nothing to secure the release of, uh, of Gonzalo. And we all know that if the Biden White House really wanted to, to secure the release of an American citizen, it would require one phone call, 20 second conversation, Antony Blinken calling up Alensky or Podoliak or one of these characters and saying, release Gonzalo Lira. And they would release him. It would be that simple. But uh, the Biden White House, the State Department, really, they're not doing anything to secure the release of Gonzalo Lira. And uh, not only did Tucker Carlson uh, shine a, a huge, a huge light, a massive spotlight on the plight and the story of Gonzalo Lira and the corrupt Alensky regime, the frightened, the frightened Alensky regime, because why do they put someone like Gonzalo Lira in prison? Because they are scared. That's why. But uh, he brought a lot of attention to the story. And then Elon Musk picked it up. You see a trend going on here, Tucker, Elon. So Elon Musk he tweets to this, uh, to this Twitter X interview, an American citizen is in prison in Ukraine after we sent over a hundred billion. Is there more to this story than simply criticizing Zelensky? If that's all it is, then we have serious problem here. And Tucker, he replied to this uh, post from Elon Musk saying, yup saying unapproved things. That's his crime. And then Elon Musk, he, uh, he posted, President Zelensky, President at Zelensky UA, please educate the American people about this matter. And then Elon said, what is the status of this American journalist at Joe Biden? And uh, Elon Musk, in his post to Joe, to, to Joe Biden, he, uh, he actually has the post from Gonzalo Lira, where Gonzalo was going to, to seek asylum in Hungary. Right now, I'm about to try to get out of Ukraine and seek political asylum in Hungary. Either I'll, either I'll cross the border and make it to safety, or I'll be disappeared by the Kiev regime. What a day yesterday. What a day. You know, Tucker, just awesome stuff. Elon, awesome stuff. Awesome, awesome stuff. Uh, Gonzalo Lira's father, Gonzalo Lira Sr., awesome man. Just awesome stuff. Uh, this, this could secure the release of, uh, of Gonzalo Lira. This could, this could secure the release of Gonzalo. Uh, the Alensky regime collapsing. That will secure the release of Gonzalo Lira. Without a doubt, that will secure the release of Gonzalo. So, uh, let's see. Let's see what develops now in the next few days. I imagine that during one of the White House press briefings, that there will be some journalists, one or two journalists in the room who will ask uh, Karine Jean-Pierre or, or say the State Department briefing. I forgot, who's the, who's the spokesman for the State Department? I forgot that guy's name. Um, or they'll ask uh, Kirby. Someone's gonna ask the Biden White House about Gonzalo Lira, given this tweet from Tucker Carlson and the tweets from uh, Musk. I mean, Musk is tweeting direct, directly at Alensky and he's tweeting directly at uh, Joe Biden. So someone's going to bring it up. I hope someone brings it up next week. And uh, what's the State Department? What is the White House going to say? What are they going to say? Uh, uh, well, you know, we're, we're trying and uh, we, we were following the developments with Gonzalo and uh, 
and we don't we don't uh, believe in interfering in uh, Ukraine's domestic legal matters. They're going to say something like that, which is just a complete effing lie. Antony Blinken can call up Elensky tomorrow, today, and he can have uh, Gonzalo released in, 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 in five minutes. But the State Department's not going to do it. Blinken's not going to do it. Uh, Newland, Newland definitely doesn't want to do it because Gonzalo, he called out Newland many times. And uh, that's his right to do so. That is his right to do it. But, uh, but we're going to see some activity now in trying to get Gonzalo uh, released. Either way, when the Alensky, uh, if he's not released now, when the Alensky government eventually collapses, which it now is, is on, the, on the fast track towards collapse, one month, three months, six months, then uh, Gonzalo's going to, to find his freedom. That's my hope. And uh, my hope is that Gonzalo does find his freedom. And I don't know, man, you know, you want to be safe. You need to, you need to make your way to, to Russia, man. <laughs> that would be my, my advice. But uh, yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the update there. And um, Project Ukraine. Project Ukraine panic continues to grow. With each day, the panic around the collapse of Project Ukraine grows and grows and grows. And uh, we have this article from, I believe this is the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail, they put out this post, this cover with the title, Other War Against a Growing Army of Critics and presidential rivals at home. And it has Alensky with a uh, picture there with Zaluzhny to one side and Klitschko to the other. Klitschko, it seems, supports Zaluzhny, by the way. And Zelensky looks upset. I've said this on a couple of videos uh, I made last week. You notice how every featured image now of Alensky is showing Alensky either sad or panicked or frightened. There are no flattering pictures of Alensky anymore. And actually, I'll take it one step further. The photos that are coming out of, uh, of Olena Zelenska with her interviews that she's been given, that she's been giving out lately, like the interview that she gave to the BBC, you can tell that they're not flattering either. You, you can see that the media, and they love to manipulate featured images and, and video and lighting. You can see that they're starting to to paint a picture of, of a worried, panicked, collapsing uh, Elensky. Just keep that in mind. Notice the photos that you're seeing of Elensky and his entire crew, his entire uh, administration. And you see that they're not, they're not the, the photos that we used to get a year ago of, of Elensky, you know, all all big and tough and defiant and, uh, <laughs> you know, wearing his, his green sweatshirt. And, no, no, you're not seeing any of that anymore. You're seeing a, a, a Nolensky that looks like he's, he's a mess. And I imagine he is a mess. Anyway, the Daily Mail, they say in this article, and I quote, images of Ukrainian President Alensky stare out from posters scattered around the city. He was once a respected figure throughout the democratic world, and especially in his own country. But, but now, those days seem almost prehistoric. The mood within the country is becoming increasingly restless. Zelensky becomes a target for the wrath of his own people. The mood is prehistoric. <laughs> Prehistoric, it almost, it seems almost prehistoric is what the Daily Mail is saying. Of the good old times, you know, a year ago, the good times when you had the, the siege of Kiev and the ghost of Kiev and, and the Kharkov counteroffensive. Those, those days are prehistoric. 
according to the Daily Mail. And the Telegraph, they put out an article, the UK Telegraph, with the title, Putin's Russia is closing in on a devastating victory. Europe's, Europe's foundations are trembling. Kiev's counteroffensive has ended in failure. This could be NATO's Suez moment. <laughs> I'm not going to get into the, the details of this article. It's, it's the same article that you've probably been reading over the past couple of weeks. Trying to explain the, uh, the failure of the big super duper counteroffensive trying to figure out who to blame, trying to figure out where it all went wrong. Uh, what else uh, does this article basically say, which is, which is an article, which is, which is like many of the articles we've read over the past couple of weeks. Things were going so well in the beginning. Uh, Russia was losing. Russia was running out of weapons. Putin was sick. Uh, he was suffering from 20 heart attacks. Shoigu was suffering from 50 heart attacks. Uh, the Kharkov counteroffensive brought hope. The Kherson counteroffensive brought hope. Uh, the siege of Kiev defeated uh, the Russian military. All the same stuff that, that they've been pushing out over the past uh, year and a half. And, and now they're starting to question, you know, where did it all go wrong? How were we so wrong? The author of this article actually even says that uh, he admits that he believed, get this, he admits that he believed the counteroffensive would actually accomplish its goals of, uh, of capturing Melitopol and getting to the Sea of Azov. <laughs> he actually admits that. I'll give him some credit. He actually admits that he believed that, uh, that nonsense. But um, the article then uh, goes on to, to say that it's not over yet. There's still some hope. And the author of this article says that uh, what Ukraine has to do now is, is dig in, create a front line, Something like uh, World War I, the author says. Something akin to World War I. Just create a huge, massive uh, front line, dig in, and just play defense. Like a massive front line that stretches across the entirety of, of Ukraine. And he says that uh, what the Ukraine military has to do now is just dig in. Dig in and play defense, stop the Russians, and then you could possibly get to some sort of, uh, of a negotiated settlement that benefits Ukraine. The author actually even says that you could even get to a point where Russia agrees to a referendum in Crimea. <laughs> I mean, that's how, that's how delusional these people still are. This article actually claims, get this, this article actually claims that, uh, that Putin, by... Uh, by shifting the Russian economy to a war economy, that Putin has brought hunger to the Russian people. The author of this article actually believes that, that, that people in, in Moscow and St. Petersburg and Russia, that people are, are suffering from, uh, from hunger. And that the, the Russian economy is falling apart. It's in tatters. It's in tatters, I tell you. Did you not read the the reports about Russia's economic growth? <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Come on. But the, he actually believes that the Russian economy is, is, is crumbling because of this conflict. And just give it some more time. You give it some more time, and then the Russian economy will completely collapse. They're still holding on to, to that hope. Well, you know, hope. Hope is the last thing to go, isn't it? Hope is the last thing to go, and that's how you know that we're coming towards, towards the end of this thing. And of course, you always have to blame, as you're looking to, to place blame on, on people for the, uh, the failure of Project Ukraine. You absolutely have to blame the, uh, the evil orange man, right? <laughs> you have to blame the evil orange man. <laughs> So the New York Times, they have an article, fears of a NATO withdrawal, withdrawal rise as Trump seeks a return to power. <laughs> you gotta blame the evil orange man. <laughs> Who can you blame for all of this? <laughs> not, not Bidenopolis, not Newland, not Blinken. Nope. <laughs> you gotta blame 
the evil orange man, not Ursula, not Jungle Joseph. It's Trump's fault. How is it Trump, Trump's fault? Don't know. <laughs> Don't know. Don't care. Because he's going to uh, win the elections and he's going to pull the U.S. out of NATO. So it's his fault. It's all his fault. <laughs> oh, boy. So that's the New York Times for you. And Forbes. Forbes put out an interesting article. Let me cross this way. Forbes put out an article with the title, A Lonely Ukrainian Challenger 2 Tank in the Snow, A Symbol of Disappointment and Hope. <laughs> a New Hope. <laughs> the Challenger Tank, A New Hope. So in this article, Forbes says that the Challenger Tank, this photo of uh, the Challenger Tank in the Snow, yes, it, uh, it's a reminder of the failure of the big super duper counteroffensive, but it's also a symbol of hope and the way uh, Forbes Forbes describes the symbol of hope is that uh, the fact that there are still Challenger 2 tanks is, uh, is hope. <laughs> the fact that the Ukraine military still has Challenger 2 tanks is hope that the big super duper counteroffensive is not over. <laughs> you know, it was Forbes. It was Forbes that reported on the, uh, the fact that the UK wanted the Challenger 2 tanks to not even approach the front line to remain in the back, to not use the Challenger 2 tanks because they were afraid that the Challenger 2 tanks would suffer the same fate as the Leopard tanks and they didn't want that bad PR. And so they, uh, they requested the Ukraine military to just keep the Challenger, the Challenger 2 tanks at a distance, to keep them far away from the front line and we're all good. <laughs> that, that, was, that was Forbes that reported on that. Now they're saying that the fact that Challenger 2 tanks exist is a positive sign. It means that the super duper counteroffensive is not, not over yet. Why do they have the barbed wire here? And in this building. So you can't go inside and check it out, unfortunately. So here's what uh, Forbes said in this article. But that the Challenger 2 is around to be photographed is a reminder that the Ukrainian military still has most of its newer Western-made equipment. And if the Ukrainians can reshape the battlefield, they can try to drive on Melitopol. It won't be easy, of course. In fact, it might be even harder a second time. This story should be my clown world. This story should be my clown world. <laughs> Really? A second time? Another, another counter-offensive Forbes? Really? Because, uh, because Ukraine was ordered by the UK to not use its Challenger 2 tanks? You think that this is a positive sign? <laughs> These guys, man. Oh boy. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. Ukraine can do another super-duper counter-offensive. You see? It still has a couple of Challenger 2 tanks. It didn't use its Challenger 2 tanks. We can make it to Melita Pole. <laughs> we can make it. Ah, boy. Sharp. Very, very sharp. This barbed bar wire, huh? So, uh, maybe, maybe Ukraine can use those Challenger 2 tanks. To make another go at, at reaching Melita Pole or the Sea of Azov. The big problem that, uh, that Ukraine and the Aletsky regime and the collective West, the big problem they have is no more soldiers. No more soldiers. That's, that's a pretty huge problem if you're going to launch a second counter-offensive. 
the Washington Post. They put out an article the other day with the title, Ukraine cracks down on draft, on draft dodging as it struggles to find truce. That's the Washington Post. Struggles to find troops. Well, where did the where did all of the troops from the the previous uh, mobilizations and and recruitment? Where did they all go? We know the answer to that. And as Ukraine struggles to to find troops and cracks down on draft dodging. We're getting more and more reports that uh, that the Alensky regime is, is just grabbing people up off the street wherever they can find them. There's one report saying that the Alensky regime, they even went into uh, a gym where people were working out and they gave uh, notices, mobilization notices to, uh, to all of the, the people in the gym. There's that report. But... Uh, Podoliak, he gave an interview to Ukraine TV, and uh, he he basically said that uh, if Ukraine citizens, if they want to live in freedom, well, they have to pay the price and go to the front line. The senior aide defended the conscription drive accusing reluctant Ukrainians of wanting to live in a free state where you can behave as you please, but not wanting to protect the rights that you love, adding that the situation will drastically change if Russia achieves victory. Podoliak also said that Kiev intends to change the propaganda element of the mobilization procedures. He explained that much depends on whether the government can win over those who don't really understand what the war is, and what consequences it may lead to if it's not finished in the right way. Change the, change the propaganda around mobilization, huh? That's how you're going to coerce, force men, women, teenagers, pensioners. That's how you're going to force them to, to join the military and go to the front line. That's Podoliak for you. I think the best way that the Alensky regime uh, can convince Ukrainians to, to go to the front line, the best thing they can do is lead by example. Lead by example. That's, that's the way I see it. Podoliak, if you want to, to send all these, all these people to the front, then I think you should, you should go first. Lead by example. You go and then everyone else will follow. So, that's Podoliak. Uh, Slavyangrad, they had an interesting post where, uh, where Ukraine uh, armed forces official and officer, Artie Green, said in an interview that uh, the Ukraine military may surrender territories in the areas in the areas of Kupiansk, Izium, and Krasny Liman and begin to retreat to the west due to the deterioration of the situation at the front. Things are collapsing, man. Things are collapsing for the Olensky regime. Things are collapsing for Olaf Schultz. Things are definitely collapsing for the German Chancellor. His uh, his approval rating is, is at an all-time low. A YouGov poll said that uh, 74% of Germans think Schultz is failing at his job. The level of public dissatisfaction with the ruling traffic light coalition has also reached a new high. That's the coalition of Annalena, 720i, Robert Habeck, and these characters. The German people think they're doing a terrible job and well, they're absolutely right about that. And uh, Olaf Schultz, sensing that he's, uh, he's hated by, by just about everybody. Well, maybe hate. Hate is not the right word. He's, he's mocked and ridiculed. 
by just about everybody. Olaf Schultz will go down in history as, as the dumbest and weakest European leader, at least in, in the last couple of decades, that's for sure. But uh, Olaf Schultz was speaking to, to his SPD party, the Social Democratic Party in Berlin. And uh, Olaf Schultz, he basically told SPD members that uh, it was Russia that cut off the gas to Germany. <laughs> Olaf, really? Yeah, that's what Olaf said. It was Russia. Russia cut off the gas. We didn't do anything. Russia decided to cut off the gas. Here's what Olaf said. It was the Russian president who stopped gas supplies through undamaged gas pipelines. Thus, 50% of Germany's gas supply was called into question. 50 billion cubic meters of gas that went through them became inaccessible, Schultz claimed during this event, hailing the government's efforts to buy gas elsewhere. <laughs> oh, Schultzy, Schultzy, little Schultzy, little Olaf Schultzy. <laughs> Okay, Schultz, we believe you. Russia cut off the gas, and it was your, your smart, cunning, courageous, brave uh, initiative to find gas elsewhere that saved Germany. <laughs> You're a hero, Olaf. You're a hero. <laughs> ah, that evil Putin, the Putin, the Putin cut off the gas. And then I decided to find gas elsewhere. You see, I saved Germany. <laughs> Olaf Schultz. Oh, man, Ola Schultz. So Medvedev, he, uh, he replied to Ola Schultz's statement that it was Russia that cut off the gas. And this is what he posted on X, Dmitry Medvedev. It was Russia that stopped to supply Europe with energy. It was the Russian president who stopped gas delivery, Schultz has said. The German is lying through his teeth. They rejected it themselves. They screwed over their own people because of the hatred of Russia, the hatred for Russia. And now they're dodging and lying. And look at the image that Medvedev has accompanying this post on, uh, on Twitter. That's... <laughs> you think Medvedev respects Olaf Schultz? Not at all. Not at all. I don't know, Olaf. I'm thinking that uh, a lot of your, your issues with energy, I don't know, they, they, may, be, they may be your fault. <laughs> maybe they're your fault. Or maybe it's the fault of, uh, of Zaluzhny and Gilligan, <laughs> the, uh, the skipper, Marianne, the professor, the millionaire and his wife, and let's not forget Ginger because they blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Maybe they're to blame for Germany's economic woes, Germany's energy problems. Who can forget Sikorsky's tweet, thank you USA, when, uh, <laughs> when Nord Stream was blown up. Thank you USA, says Radek Sikorsky, a European parliament member and one time foreign minister of Poland who was Coincidentally, who was uh, in Ukraine during the Maidan revolution, the Maidan coup, <laughs> the revolution, what did they call it? The Maidan revolution of dignity or something like that. Yep, that's Sikorsky. What Olaf Schultz is talking about is, uh, is the whole turbine thing. That's what he's referencing. Remember the whole turbine issue where the turbines uh, needed maintenance? They needed repair for Nord Stream, I think Nord Stream 1. And so Siemens, via the, the contract and the terms of, uh, of the cooperation, Siemens sent the turbines to Canada for repair. And it was a total of like five or six turbines. And, uh, and then Trudeau, Trudeau said, yeah, I can't, uh, I can't return those turbines to Russia via the contract because of the sanctions. And so Schultz was like, well, if you can't get them to Russia, then how do we fix, uh, how do we get Nord Stream 1 back up and running? And uh, Trudeau was like, I don't know. <laughs> and Schultz is like, well, send them to Germany. And then the Russians were like, no, no, you can't send them to Germany. That's, that breaks the, the terms of the agreement. 
the chain of custody, and we can't have that. The agreement says that Canada has to send it to, to Russia once they repair the turbines, and then everything will be good. Uh, that, that was pretty much what, uh, what, what Olaf Scholz is referencing when he's blaming Russia. He's talking about the whole turbine debacle. I did a lot of uh, updates on the whole turbine thing. A lot, of, a lot of reports on the whole turbine thing. Schultz calling Trudeau and trying to figure things out. Yeah, that's, that's what Schultz is talking about. Trudeau, you idiot. I need those turbines. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to get Nord Stream back up and running. Oh, I'm sorry, Olaf, but uh, I can't send those turbines to Russia because if I send those turbines to Russia, Antony's going to be very upset with me and... I hate it when Anthony is upset with me. I like it when Blinken is happy with me. So, Olaf, I can't send those turbines to, uh, to Russia. Trudeau, you idiot. What am I going to do now? <laughs> Maybe it's time to blow up Nord Stream. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's, that's what this is all about. That is, that is what uh, Schultz is referencing here. So let's do a quick update on Guyana, and then we'll do a clown world. There, uh, there's going to be a meeting on December 14th between Venezuela and Guyana. Nicolas Maduro and Mohamed Irfan Ali of Guyana, and they're going to meet on December the 14th in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and they're going to try and resolve this dispute. Good news. Very good news there. I believe Brazil and Lula, they'll be, they'll be a part of these uh, negotiations to try and uh, de-escalate this situation and avoid a conflict in, uh, in the region. So that's good news. December 14th. Let's now do a quick clown world and we'll wrap up this video. I really don't have, I was looking for a clown world today and I really don't have much to go on. The Forbes story should have been my clown world, but uh, how about, okay, the panic, the panic with Project Ukraine, the Collective West, they, uh, they couldn't get the regime change in Russia that they were aiming for, and, uh, and now we have Putin announcing that elections, elections will take place on March 2024, and Putin is going to run for re-election. And now the Collective West, well, they can't really uh, promote Navalny. They'll try to promote, promote Navalny, but, you know, Navalny's in prison for various crimes. And so the Collective West, they're looking for, for some new fresh faces to act as a foil to, to the Putin. And it looks like they may have found someone. The Times, the UK Times writes, meet the woman risking it all to challenge Putin at Russian election. Former journalist Yekaterina Dunsova is taking a stand against the Kremlin's repression. It's scary, but fear should not prevail, she is quoted as saying. Does anyone know who this person is? I have no idea. I have no idea who this is. Maybe, maybe people in Russia know who this journalist is. I've never heard of her. But uh, she's going to be running against Putin, and it looks like the, the UK has taken a liking. They've taken a liking to Yekaterina Duntsova. She is going to try and defeat the Putin. It's scary, but fear should not prevail. So maybe they have found Navalny 2.0. I don't know. I don't know. They're definitely searching for somebody to to put out there against, uh, to promote and put out there against Putin, against the Putin, the all-powerful, the Putin. All right, that's the video, everybody. TheDuran.Locals.com. We are on Odyssey, BitChutes, Rumble, Telegram, and Twitter X, and go to the Duran shop. There you go. Austria today. The Green Alensky Special Edition and uh, pick up some merch 20% off. Use the code V Duran 
20 business for sale. Bennigan's. All right. Take care.